Um, so this is the point of the talk where I realized, you know, practicing probably would have been a good idea. Um, so we're going to do this the seat of the pants way, per usual. Um, so I am the maintainer of Selenium ID, and so when we needed a, when we looked at the slots that were being assigned for the schedule, it's like, you know, we don't really have a Selenium IDE talk, so you're going to do a talk. All right. So then I promptly forgot that I was doing a talk and remembered, oh, like a day or so ago. So here we, this is going to be talking about the plugins that, um, from a high level perspective and sort of a, where are we now in Selenium IDE and where we're going. So this whole journey started with a blog post that I did the better part of two years ago where I said, you know, for all these you know, Selenium companies that are starting to go, up, go out, what we need is a way that we can maintain the open sourceness, but also make money from it. Because let's face it, money pays the mortgage. Uh, as much as we like to say to the bank, well, you know, I wrote some code and gave it away to the world. They don't take that as part of the payment. So I sort of put up this little diagram of, well, we have Selenium in the middle, and we've got like company A over here and company B over here. Should be a way for us to like figure out how to do this so that we can have commercial versions of Selenium as well as the open source stuff. Um, and of course, you know, these are dangerous roads to go down to because as soon as you start talking like this, people are saying, that's awesome. But nobody has the time to do it. And quite rapidly, you end up being the one who has to do it. So after that sort of talk started happening, um, I wrote another blog post of, you know, if I ruled the world, this is so the sort of thing that you know, Selenium IDE would uh, be able to do. Things like plugins that you'd be able to have custom, um, you know, cl custom formatters easily deployed throughout the enterprise, and you'd be able to make your own things to integrate with your own services, and it would, it would just nicely play in the Selenium ecosystem. Um, and of course, you know, it'd be all like rainbows, unicorns, lollipops, etc. And around that time, it was made, became official. It's like, well, nobody else is really picking up the mantle on Selenium IDE, so you're now the maintainer, and your job is to implement this grand vision that you so boldly put out on the internet. Um, and so what began was the great pluginification. Um, so modeling after Firebug, which is when I was making my If I Ruled the World statement, you've got Firebug, which is a plugin to Firefox, and then you can have all these other add-ons, like FireFinder is a great plugin for figuring out your locators. Um, you got YSlow for quick and dirty analysis of, uh, of your page speeds. And so I wanted to sort of model the Selenium IDE plugin ecosystem after that. Um, and then we got hit, sort of struck by this great big, you know, air horns are going off, irony alert. As the maintainer of Selenium IDE, it is my sort of goal to make Selenium IDE a better product for you to use and build upon. As a Selenium consultant, it is my job to say, get the heck out of IDE as soon as humanly possible, if not faster. So I'm in this interesting situation of trying to make the product better so that I can recommend people not use it. But if you want to be, use it, it will be a much better experience. So what sort of things can you do in plugins that we need to care about? Custom commands. Um, I'm a huge, as a tester, I'm a huge fan of random data. So I could add a command into Selenium IDE to create a random text string of somewhere between 8 and 12 characters. And so that when my scripts run, it won't just always have username Adam. It'll have like username gobbledygook, um, which of course makes better tests. Um, abstracting out your locators. Your scripts should not have locators in them. They should be out in a separate file that is maintained, version controlled, um, so that when the world changes, and it does change, it's not a matter of if it changes, it's when it changes, you'll be able to just rename the element in one spot and all your scripts are, are through the you know, miracles of magic, 
uh, working again. You can also modify the behavior of, uh, your, of Selenium IDE itself, so that you know, things like adding to the pop-up menu that, that uh, is integrated. Now, sure, you can do all that stuff you know, by hand, but management of that um, becomes an absolute nightmare. Um, if you're just having it checked into version control, then everybody needs to remember to update their version control, which is, it's not that hard to forget to do it. Um, and or, you know, your you know, file distribution through email, just everybody's blasted out. It's like, oh, well, we updated the user extensions, but everybody please extend, please update it. And then when a bug is found five minutes later and they send out another one, and the bug is found five minutes later and they send out another one, um, Eventually, people stop ignore, start to ignore those emails, and now you have 20 different versions of the user extensions running in your, in your organization, and you wonder why your scripts aren't working. Um, so with plugins, we can leverage the whole um, Firefox extension updating mechanism. That's, that's how, when I package up a new build of Selenium IDE, everybody gets a little pop-up box uh, onto their machine. Um, so that's the, the gist of the plugins, are so that you can easily deploy all these customized things, because you don't want to be running just a vanilla Selenium IDE. Um, there are far more efficient ways to do it, but they're all custom to your environment, so it's not as if it's something that I or the people that help me on Selenium IDE can um, implement into the system. So I'm now tasked with writing this big plugin system. What do I realize? I realize that the Mozilla kids that developed the plugin system are really, really, really smart. Um, so the way a plugin works, um, so the workshops from yesterday, I'll collect all the slides and all the source code and I'll put it up online and you'll actually be able to download the files. So, when you look at the workshop that Samit did, they've got, it, it's, all, it's just a series of overlays, including the actual browser itself. It's written in the, the UIs in a language called Zool, XUL. Um, I think it's like XML, the user interface language or something along those lines. And so what you have is like this base XML that you then say, oh, and I want to overlay this bit of XML that adds new feature functionality to it, like it's a new toolbar. And then we take this XML and we overlay it again, and now we've got a new item on that new toolbar. So what Selenium IDE is, is a XML layover onto the main browser. Selenium IDE plugins then are XML overlays onto the Selenium IDE overlay. So you have this multi-layer effect adding, or also interestingly, removing things from um, from the interface. I've often threatened but get pushback from the other committers that I'm going to in create a plugin that will disable the ability to save Selenese scripts and ship that by default that's turned on in Selenium IDE. Forcing people to really consider, do I want to save this as Selenese or do I want to export it because that's the way that I'm being not so gently nudged to do. Um, so writing plugins is actually surprisingly easy. I thought it was, was going to be this huge task, but in the span of about two days, I had it more or less figured out. So the quickest way to start writing a plugin is to clone my example plugin and modify it to your needs. Um, I wrote this particular plugin as I was writing the tutorial on how to write plugins. So there is a pretty direct correlation between the tutorial and this plugin. Um, there are some other, you know, there are some bits that have been added to it that I need to get pushed in still, but that'll get you a large majority of the way through it. The plugins themselves, let's have a, like a quick tour of the API. We had um, in the workshop yesterday, we had um, some quick samples. For a second there, I thought that was my phone and somebody else's. So all plugins, the first thing a plugin needs to do is it needs to register itself. 
technically it doesn't have to. There's no um, checks to see, oh, a plugin's loading and it's not registered itself. But by registering it, you get your name up in the nice little, these are the enabled plugins um, box in, in IDE. Um, and it is, because it's XML, we actually sort of cheat around and say, in this blob of XML, we're going to actually run some JavaScript. Um, the API is fairly obvious. It's just add a plugin. If you want to add a command, then commands are stored in user extensions, just as if you would by hand run them with, uh, you know, to browse and import them into the UI. Um, it takes a Chrome URL. Zool references everything in terms of Chrome URLs, which is why there's this massive confusion in the Selenium world. It's just like, well, I want to launch a browser. I want to launch Google Chrome, so I'm going to use star Chrome as my browser string. That's actually Firefox. If you want Google Chrome, it's star Google Chrome. And people are like, but why is Firefox using Chrome? It's more like, why is Google using Chrome? Because it was in Firefox a lot a lot earlier. And again, you can do things like adding formats. If you are exporting scripts from Selenium IDE, create a custom format for your company. It is the eBay formatter. It is the Salesforce formatter. It is my company's name formatter. Even if you don't make any changes immediately to the script, or to the formatter, at some point you're going to need to or want to modify it to work with your custom framework. For instance, maybe you have a, an import that you need to put into every single script that comes out of Selenium IDE. You can put that in the formatter, and now you've saved yourself 20 characters every single time. I'm lazy. I enjoy not having to type. Let the tool type for you. Um, so in this case, it just takes the name, the unique name, what it's going to be displayed in the screen, and the location of the JS. If you wanted to add new behavior to it, maybe you want to add a locator, maybe you need to add like a, something to the pop-up menu. And these are all in the, the you know, my original plan was, hey, I can do live coding. The examples that Samit has in his uh, little zip file, they cover all of these lovely APIs, and I don't need to do live coding, which is sort of rule number one, don't do live coding, especially if you can't type. Um, so, what the, the examples don't have, though, is things like the larger Firefox capabilities that you can use in a plugin. Um, for instance, the password manager. If you have credentials that you need to access your um, internal services, external services, um, that you just don't want kicking around in the configuration system, so basically you say about config, and maybe it says, my.service.username equals Adam, my.username.service equals password. Anybody who gets onto your machine can now just say about config and read those out. Or they're just stored in a JS file in your profile directory. Using the password manager, you can store things in a secure way. And so you just access things um, uh, without worrying too greatly about the machine, you know, what happens when somebody is on the machine that's not supposed to. It also gives people a nice warm and fuzzy feeling knowing that their passwords are a little more protected. If you're doing plugins, you have a decision. First, you can just say, you know, the first decision is, is it internal or is it external? If it's an internal plugin, you can host it just on a web server or somewhere um, in behind the firewall. Nobody ever needs to know that it exists. Um, if they're outside of the firewall and it tries to update, it'll whine in the logs, but you won't actually see it. Um, and so that, like, that's an easy decision, saying we're not going to host it on addons.mozilla.org or AMO, just as, um, if you, well, addons is a long word to type in email, so just AMO is the short name. Um, so, but if it's an external one, you have a decision to make. Do you want to host it in AMO or not? So Selenium ID is actually self-hosted. If you go to uh, addons.mozilla.org and look for Selenium IDE, you will find a bunch of plugins, but you will not find the actual, plug the actual um, Selenium IDE itself. We host that on our own servers. 
um, largely because the update process for AMO is a people process. So you upload something and then they need to look it over and then the de depending on the editor they have to decide whether or not they like you and um, whether or not they'll actually publish it or reject it saying you're doing things that you're not supposed to do in a browser. Um, which is what we got ran into when we sort of pick, picked up development again. Um, our update was rejected by AMO and they're like well you're not supposed to tie into the browser to be able to record events like this. Wow, that's kind of the point of Selenium IDE is to record events. So thank you, but we'll just self-host now. Um, so there's lots of things we don't get from um, hosting inside AMO, but we also get the freedom of being able to push at any point and not have to wait two or three weeks for an editor to look at it. Um, if you are um, building out these files, XPI files, just pronounced zippy. Um, you can do them as one monolithic zippy file, and that's what Selenium IDE was up until the last release, I believe. And so upon the last release, people are like, oh my god, there's like nine plugins that are updating. What we have done is we have split out all, there's like the editor zippy file, and then there are language specific zippies uh, for each of the formatters. So it's up to you which ones you in want to install. If you aren't a PHP shop, then don't install the PHP one. Only install the one that you need. It also means that we effectively split the development lifecycle, or decouple the development lifecycle of formatters from the editor itself. So if we find a bug in the PHP formatter, we can push only the PHP formatter and not the whole kit and caboodle um, out at one time. And then just periodically we'll make a, you know, an official point release. So that's called a multi-installer zippy file. Um, and if you're using things internally, you could make your own zippy file that has your custom one, the formatter, and the editor all in one um, that you control the, the versions of. So I thought I had way too many slides, but we're flying through these, which is amazing, because I've, I've completely hit the sugar wall and crashing. Um, so if you are writing public um, Selenium IDE plugins. There are, there's no real rules that right now. Basically, you write a plugin, you load it on AMO, or selenium.org will host it for you if, if you want to self-host. Then you email us and say, here's the location where I can find bugs, here's what it does, and we'll add it to the list of plugins that you can, uh, that you can use. What I'm starting to think that um, we need to be a little more rigorous in the requirements of what we accept as a Selenium IDE plugin on the selenium.org site. Um, and so these are starting to, my thinking is of sort of the how to play nice with Selenium IDE. So there's, here's sort of a duh moment for a lot of people that start to think around, oh, our company should create this great Selenium IDE plugin and it'll be fantastic but we want to make it proprietary and, and put all sorts of trade secrets or things that we think are trade secrets. Except that Selenium IDE plugins or Firefox plugins in general are pretty much open source by default. You may not think that they are, but a zippy file is just a zip file. And JavaScript is, well, just text. And Zool is just XML, which is text. So you can crack open these plugins and get all the source code. So Selenium being an open source project, I'm very close to saying that in order to get listed on the selenium.org site as a public, um, as, as Selenium IDE plugin, you have to officially open source um, the plugin. Um, so, because it's already open source, might as well just make it, wrap it in a license and make it legit. Um, also, don't go crazy on the branding. And I've talked to a number of companies um, that have started to think about creating plugins for Selenium IDE. And the first thing they would say is that we want to rebadge the whole darn thing. Um, so I have a couple problems with this. If you rebadge the whole platform, you basically fork the project. 
And there is, in, maybe not in code itself, but at least in perception in the community. Um, so if you have, you know, if I had the element 34 plugin, that would change this to the, change Selenium IDE to the super cool record playback tool by element 34. It's still Selenium IDE under the hood, but you know, other plugins are going to start to be confused. Documentation is going to start to get confused because all the menu items are different. Um, so I'm thinking, uh, you know, again, this is just sort of throwing ideas out that if you rebrand the core of Selenium IDE, you don't get listed as an official plugin. I don't think there's any plugins, for instance, that for Firebug, that it now becomes the YSlow plugin or the YSlow toolbar powered by Firebug. So don't go crazy on the brand branding. If you are working on plugins, and you know plugins are kind of a cool thing to work on, complete and continue back to the tutorial. So the documentation on how to write Selenium IDE plugins is basically a long series of blog posts that I wrote, and I think now includes one or two that Samet wrote while he was working on stuff. I'm more than happy to just keep adding people's blog posts to this tutorial. Uh, for instance, I'm going to start harassing somebody for one on how to do the on first load um, step. Uh, so that when you install a new version of the plugin, you get the nice little HTML page that says, here's what changed. Because um, I know that that's, that's a problem that's solved, been solved but not documented yet. So that's sort of the how to play nice in the Selenium IDE um, ecosystem. The future for Selenium IDE, um, hopefully it involves flying cars. Um, I'm not too sure about this particular flying car. It doesn't seem the most structurally sound one that you can think of. Um, my inbox is overflowing with requests for, or along the lines of, hey, you know, Firefox 4 came out like three weeks ago. Where's the Selenium IDE version that supports it? Um, and the answer is, it will go out when it, the Selenium IDE isn't completely broken for it. We had it working for, I believe, last time I saw it was beta 1, but in final, it, well, the recording's broken, which is kind of that key component that makes Selenium IDE useful to people. Um, so once we lick that problem, I actually know the line of code that's failing. I just need to figure out why it's failing. Um, then we will push it out. But we haven't just ignored Firefox 4. Um, the way that we're going to support WebDriver, um, there is an overwhelming theme to the conference of you really, 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 really should be writing page objects. The problem with record playback tools and page objects is that we need to invent the plugin that reads your mind for your object model. And that's a much harder problem to solve than most of the problems we have to solve with Selenium IDE. So Selenium IDE cannot pump out page objects. So it does the same procedural style format that you get with remote control style scripts, but we will have a web driver export as well. So you'll go tools, export, um, and it'll say Java web driver. Python web driver, and it'll, and it'll give you the web driver syntax, at which point you'll have to copy and paste it out into your page objects. That's about the best that we can do for that. I've got this pipe dream of having another, yet another tab in the options menu to be able to control the order that locators are being executed in. So deep down in the guts of Selenium IDE, there is this notion of a locator builder. And they get, they get loaded in the order that they are in the source code file. It's not deterministic. You know, it's not going to be this one, then this one, then this one. It's, it's just going to be the order that they are processed in the JS. Um, the current code in subversion now actually makes it a hard-coded order that you know. But I would like to have a screen on the uh, in the options menu that says, I don't want to use any XPath, so I'm going to disable these locators. 
and I want to have name before ID and CSS after DOM, for instance. Um, and so you have a nice little move things around dialog. That's sort of sketched out in my mind, and it's, being, it's a matter of time to program it. Selenium IDE is not going to grow any more code. In fact, we're trying desperately to remove code. So most people uh, are not using the UI element functionality of Selenium. Anyone using it? Room full of 300 people, not a single person. Oh, one. All right, that's about the ratio I would expect if you were like a third of a person. Um, so UI element's kind of cool. It takes what was in, well, I learned how automation with Windrunner. It take, you've got this map, UI map of locators, and then you just reference that, the locators in that map. So I recommend people use like just a user extension, but you can use this UI element. And it is tightly, tightly, tightly integrated into what used to be called Selenium Core. Um, and since nobody's really using it, well, except for you. Uh, there's a bunch of code that can get removed from Selenium Core because it really is more of like a Selenium IDE only component. Right? You know, the, the people that use UI element typically use it with Selenium IDE rather than with remote control. So the plan is to make UI element also a plugin that will rip out a whole whack of code from the core and hopefully clean that up a little more. More things for the future. So here's one of these ironic, another of these ironic little secrets that don't tell anybody, but this talk is being recorded to be shown around the world. Um, there is very little tests, automated tests for Selenium IDE, which is you know, kind of amusing. So the release process for Selenium IDE is I create a build and I bang it on a bit and then I announce it on Twitter and some other people bang on it for a bit and then we release it, and then we get people using it in anger, and we get bug reports saying, you broke this really obvious thing. How did you miss it? Um, and then we go through this cycle over and over again. Things like, oh, CSS selectors don't work because you forgot to include a file. Um, so we're starting to fix that. We're starting to rebuild the um, Selenese suite that will exercise commands. Um, Dave Hunt, uh, or at, at uh, Mozilla, who may or may not be kicking around the room somewhere, um, he started using Mozmil to um, automate the actual UI. So that, that's going to be pretty cool because before we could just automate, just create, basically create a test suite in Selenium or in Selenese and make sure that it goes green. But now we are pushing buttons, choosing options, um, and getting real coverage in, this, in, this, in the browser. So that's coming. Feel free to contribute, because we can always use more. There's like 500 commands in that drop-down box. And ideally, we should have a script to make sure they all work. And that's just a lot of work. Uh, can also help us clean up the code. Again, my, my slide decks have like Star Wars, at least just one Star Wars reference. Usually have a lol cat. That was the abstract cat. I just took off the lol part, because it didn't fit the slide have pirates. Pirates are cool. Um, so Selenium IDE code is fantastically complicated, and I don't know how the hell it works 90% of the time. So we need to do cleanups so that we can figure out what's going on in there. For instance, how on earth do you log? There's log statements through all the, that whole thing, but I can't get them to execute anywhere. So we'll be cleaning up the code. And really, once we start, once the code's in a nice state, and we've got the plugin API pretty nailed down and things in, that are already existing that should be plugins, we're feature complete. Go to air quotes, feature complete. And there shouldn't be that much more development on the actual core editor aside from making sure that it continues to work with versions of Firefox. Um, you know, adding new formatters, well, that's a plugin. Modif you know, updating, current, updating the JUnit format to JUnit 4, well, that's, again, it's a plugin. It's not the actual editor itself that's being changed. So we want people to be writing plugins, not actual editor code. 
And the, the last slide that I've got, and this is sort of a sneak peek to what's coming this summer, is we're going to be creating a X-unit style runner for Selenese scripts. So if, you're gonna, if you insist on using Selenese as a scripting language, then what you need to do, if you need to run it on IE or any other, other languages, you have to use the dash HTML suite flag on your remote control server. What this ends up doing is that your server is constantly flapping up and down as it restarts, you know, runs the sweep, shuts down, restarts, runs the sweep, shuts down, produces the output in, in like HTML so it can't be consumed by a CI server without having to transform it. So one of the, so Selenium is a Google Summer of Code project uh, uh, again this year. One of the projects we're going to do is a X unit runner so it'll have a setup, you know, run this script as setup, run this script as teardown. Um, and it also means that your, your Selenium server can stay up the whole time. It just becomes yet another client as if it was like a Ruby client or a Python client. And so you don't have this constantly flapping um, uh, remote control server. So that is sort of the very high level, you know, use plugins. You know, that's one of the takeaways. Use the plugins internally. Um, it just makes distribution and management of your custom code so much easier. If you are a commercial company that has like a Selenium service or um, things along those lines, look at Selenium IDE plugins as a way of providing your service to the end user. You don't need to write yet another um, client application that are you know, complicated web app. Just sit it in the browser. Use it as a plugin. Um, we've got the Selenese runner. Again, that's the Google Summer of Code project, so expect that to come probably around September, um, which will also allow us to rip more code out of the Selenium server, which is a good thing. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, oh yes, and uh, please stop emailing me about Firefox 4 support. I know it's there, I don't know, I, and it's coming. So we're like, yeah. 14 minutes left in the time slot, and so now we can take the random Selenium IDE questions if you so choose, or you can all go to sleep for the next speaker, until the next speaker. Questions, anyone? Nobody uses IDE, I'm just here because I have the most talking slots of the day. Anyone going once? All right, so if you do have questions about how to use Selenium IDE or need, the, you know, want to sort of one-on-one -on -one tutorial on how to create plugins, you can grab me at any time. And we're done. <laughs>